produced by Ranting Rhino Productions. Praxis Pedagogy exists to position our teaching and learning practice within different methodologies. We want to construct a guild of educators dedicated to designing a difference in our own teaching and learning and in our students' experience. to episode 65 of Praxis Pedagogy Podcast, this special edition where Sally, Lucy, and I sit down and talk about a great book that we're reading right now called Appreciative Inquiry in Higher Education. And we're talking about chapter two in this episode. And in chapter two, there's a lot of stuff in it. And and essentially, chapter two is the process of appreciative inquiry. I think you're really going to love this episode. There's tons of stuff we talk about in the chapter and also get some practical advice, tips, and applications as to how we can begin using the the material from chapter two. But let me read for you a little snippet of chapter two, which really encapsulates the whole appreciative inquiry approach. It says appreciative inquiry is a paradigm shift in approaches to human system change that moves away from problem solving and a focus on the deficits in a system by examining the strengths and successes where the key question is, what is working well in the organization? Like I said, you're going to love this episode. It was an honor and a privilege and tons of fun to sit down with Sally and Lucy on this one. We'll catch you on the other side. Here we go. Ready? Three. Two, one. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Praxis Pedagogy Podcast. This is the podcast where we like to center our pedagogy on sound principles and work towards building a community of educators to increase awareness and satisfaction of not only our teaching and learning, but also for our students. Pretty good, eh? I've got that pretty much memorized. Said it enough times. It's all good. So we are here. This is number two in the series of Appreciative Inquiry in Higher Education. Like I've done with a lot of things, I make it into an acronym. The AI for H E. Oh, oh. AI for H E. And 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 because I'm a nerd, I went and looked it up in the Latin. That A I H E actually means principles. <gasps> no way. Yeah. So figure that wow. out. That's uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Anyway. People have already shut off the podcast, so we better better get into the content here. So for those of you who have missed it, we are in chapter two called The Tenets of Appreciative Inquiry, written by Jeannie Cockle. And did I say that right? Cockle Mm -hmm. and Joan MacArthur Blair. And uh, it's the second edition. There will be a link in the show notes if you want to purchase it. Or you can go to the website, right, Lucy, and send an email. Yeah, you can um, actually go to the website and yeah, put it in the show notes and you can request a free digital copy from Apple Books. So That's right. That's right. Yeah. So do but that. then if you have a digital copy, can you really do all the writing and circling and coloring that you no, did? No, no, no. You can highlight in different colors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's um, not the same. But it's it not doesn't the same. smell the same either. Like no. no, you need the real book. And and like we said last time, it's it's a good book to carry around because yep. Um, there are things that you can pull from it when you need to, you know. That's right. That's right. I started with the free copy. That's what got me hooked. And Mm -hmm. after reading four chapters of it on my phone, just, you know, as that was (laughs) on your phone. Well, you know, those times when (laughs) you kept waiting. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, And then I was so hooked by this book. But I just thought, okay, that's it. I I have to have this book for the exact reasons that you said got to get in there and write yep. in those yeah in the margins i think i think off the record although we were recording this this would be a good this would be a good book to do a pints and pedagogy over a chapter mm-hmm. yeah i think so especially this chapter because there's so much you, well actually maybe well, i maybe can always press pause <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, off you go and get a pint yeah, that's right off you go Let's start that right now. That's um, right. But um, it's just there's lots of different things like within this chapter that I mm-hmm. feel that everyone will be able to kind of draw from and relate to. And um, yeah, I feel like they're part of the conversation, um, especially with the type of people that we we tend to surround ourselves with. I feel that a lot will come from this and, you know, trades educators as well, because it talks a, a little bit about that, you know, constructivism and and experiential and so uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's a good 
good idea. All right. So our homework was to read the chapter. If you were to give a synopsis of the chapter, a summary, a quick abstract, what might you say? Um, well, for me, well, no, for me. <laughs> That's a good question. No, I, I think um, this chapter is a statement for how you are able to facilitate um, positive change, um, you know, give a clearer vision, how to identify a clearer vision, how to pull together a team and identify cultures. So um, this is why I thought this chapter for me, it was like this, this is the one that got me hooked into the book and I've, I've you know, I've read it a couple of times and made different notes and, and um, it, a lot of what they talk about in this chapter is really what hooked me into being at uh, work in, you know, leaving my trade, um, as it were, and actually working the ed- educational side of it and, and the leadership side of it. Um, and I think a lot of these themes that are in this chapter, naturally, it was part of how I, how I am and how I deliver some of these, um, some, some of the ideas, um, and also build a team as well, like through it. So I would say that, so, you know, how you would facilitate positive change in different cultures and, you know, build that desire of what people want and the framework in how you can do it, different frameworks. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I I mean, you summarized that really well, Lucy, it's the paradigm shift for me that that's my big takeaway from this. And I love the fact that they, you know, the way they present this idea and they give comparisons, you know, between the, the problem solving approach, which I think many of us have experienced and we may have different times actually led unknowingly led in a way in that way. But they're very um, they 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 sort of put forward this idea of this whole different approach. But they follow it through. They follow the idea through with, uh, which is what we're going to talk about today. So it really feels like, yeah, we'll tell you about this paradigm shift, but now we're going to tell you how you can go away. You can implement it. And I think throughout this chapter, they really provide you what I would call with that kind of scaffolding so that you can really think through the whole process. So that's my, yeah, yeah. I like that because that was one of the things that I looked at too, like rather than looking at the, you know, the problems, you look at the strengths and the successes and then just keep building on that in every, in the darkest, darkest room, you know, find that piece of light and then open it up and that it's it's exactly right. And, And we sometimes unfortunately do get drawn into the, the, you know, the problems and, and it talks about that in the chapter, like we're not computers. You can't, you can't problem, you know, fix us. Like we are a computer, we are human. And, you know, we need to build upon that human quality rather than just try to fix it, you know? So, yeah. I also like how they, um, they say that we don't ignore the problems though we we focus in you know what it what is what does it feel like what does it look like when you're at your best and and talk about all the different contexts but they they said in this chapter that if you go into a very problematic situation maybe it's a faculty or maybe it's department and there's there are key issues um, you can't do that thing where you just start on top of the key issues. And I, and that to me was like a breath of fresh air because up until that point, I was picturing myself in one of those environments when you know all of these feelings are sort of, you know, building in the background and you know the issues that are going on and you know some of them. And so the way they said, yes, yeah, some, you know, in some situations, listen to that. And then you pivot into, well, you know, what it, you at your best. And so that to me was, yeah, this is, this is an approach that, that resonates with me. The fact that we're not sweeping anything under the table, you know, or under the rug, whatever that saying is. And they identify that it's hugely dangerous to do that. And that that's what they're not explaining to do and, and they're not stating to do. Um, but I think one thing that we all know is when you go into, if you've ever been into, a, you know, a group of people or a situation where it has been, 
you know, there has been a lot of um, you know, negative behavior or, to- you know, it's been a toxic environment. Um, one thing that's probably not happened is you've never really identified the successes and the strengths. They, they don't talk about it. They only talk about, again, it's the whole meeting will probably surround the issues that they're having and they don't ever have time for that. So it's also looking at, you know, how do you manage, how do you manage this well? And I think if you understand AI and you really do start looking into how to um, facilitate AI properly, then that will make you a master of making people feel their worth and want to do better within their, within their setting. So, yeah, I, I, I felt that too, Sally. Yeah. And I'm sure Tim's waiting to hop in here, but he's just waiting for us to take a breath. Um, it reminded me of what you were just saying there reminded me of, you know, when I was full-time instructing and, and sometimes there would be, you know, a couple of students within, you know, two classes of 48, whatever, but those two students, the, some of the issues that were coming forward were taking up so much of the time. And so you would be paying so much of spending so much of your time and attention on dealing with the problems. And yet it was taking you away from the rest of your class. And, and, um, I know that in the book, they talk about this 80 20 rule and and sometimes you spend all of your energy like in leadership or in you know as an instructor you can spend a lot of your energy on the 20 percent of the issues within that class or dealing with that and by just even recognizing that actually even knowing that so you could even catch yourself thinking okay i need to shift to the 80% that are really succeeding and focusing in on there. So again, they, they talk about this, don't they? Just the fact that the language allows you to think differently as well. There's a really nice, I'll let you hop in, Tim, and I'm going to look for that quote while you, yes. Well, thank you for creating the space for me to hop in. Um, so a couple things, a couple things uh, stick out to me in this chapter. One is that uh, I like the uh, approach of inquiry creates change. And oftentimes we come to situations, problems, sticking points, and we come with our own biases and, and preconceived solutions, right? And they often don't work because we don't know the context. We don't know the people. We don't know the intricacies of, of, of the dynamic. It's an, it's an open system. So it takes time to figure that kind of stuff out. So to come with a preconceived cookie cutter solution, I think is uh, you're setting yourself up for, for at least frustration and maybe even failure. So I like that. I like the idea of inquiry creates change. The other thing that stuck out to me was the emergent design piece. And, and it leads to my last comment about the chapter. So I, I've always loved the emergent piece of appreciative inquiry. I just, I love it. It's so powerful. It decentralizes the whole process. And, and, and if you create the right environment and, and if you can facilitate half decently, this becomes your, your magic, you know, key to the whole thing. It's just allowing things to, to emerge on their own. Yeah. Thirdly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know there was, didn't know I got two more. I got two more. Okay. Yeah. I'll wait. I'll wait. And then thirdly, it's the <laughs> values. Cause they mentioned that a couple times in the chapter It's values based, value centered, uh, combined even with strengths based so that there's, there's a, there's an, there's a push to find the value and that that's tied into the inquiry creates change. And so when we look at the inquiry creates change, paradigm, what you're really doing is you're searching for value. You're searching for what that group really, really values because ultimately the conflict comes when the values don't match the outcome or the values don't match the methodology. And, and then you have that, you have tension that, that creates tension. Um, so that I love that values piece. Finally, they, they do a pretty good job of providing a diagram and going through the five D's based on the four D model. And that's great, but I'm a nerd and I, and I, I make up my own diagram. I kept some of the language, but my five D's includes a surprise at the end for some, not a surprise for you two, I think. And really this is the process 
So when people ask me, Lucy, how do I facilitate a group of tradespeople to, to move from point A to point Z uh, the way that I do, this is the process I use. So here it is. One, determine. So do your homework. Do your homework on, on these people that you're meeting with. Two, dialogue over discussion. And, there's, and this is something that I learned in my master's that is a little fluffy, but you know, it, it, it touched a, a string with me because what, the, what, this, what this book was saying was that discussion tends to be too much of, I want to speak over top of you. So, and, they, and they made the, the connection that discussion is like percussion, like, perc- like you're banging a drum. And pretty soon, if you keep banging that drum, people tune you out. But dialogue is different. Dialogue searches for the other person to speak more than you speak. Because when they're speaking more, you're listening more. And that's, and that's always better. So dialogue over discussion. The third D, describe the ideal state. So you know where you are, but where do you want to be? If all things were equal and money wasn't an issue and you had the time that you wanted to, to, accom- to accomplish what you want to accomplish, what does that really look like? So in... In other circles, they would call that visioning or creating a vision statement or, or you know, um, putting, in, putting what you want into pictures and, and driving towards that. So, you know, picture boards and all that stuff. So, describe the ideal state. Fourth one is decide. So, what are your next steps? So, you've gone through this whole process of, I've done my homework. We've, we've had a ton of dialogue where I've done very, very little or no talking, lots of listening. And then I get you to describe the ideal state that you want to be in as a group. You tell me what you want to, what you want to do, where you want to go, who you want to be. And now we decide how, how are we going to get there? What, what are you, what do you think are the steps that we need to get there? Um, and then the, f- the fifth one, and this is not the surprise for you too, is the, the design piece, design thinking process where we bring in the idea of, um, you know, you, 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 you ideate and then you prototype and then you test and then you evaluate and then you ideate and you prototype and you test and you keep doing that iteration until you find something that works or you make it work more efficiently or more effectively. That's my brief summary of the chapter. Mm. Wow. That was pretty impressive. Um, for those readers that readers for those that don't, know about the um, 4D cycle that is actually a 5D cycle in the book. It'll be really interesting, Tim. I'm sure you're going to have this in the show notes that actually taking the model that's in the, in the, um, in the book and then comparing it with your model. And I think it's, that's a really nice, uh, you know, um, way that you've adapted it there. And anybody that's uh, spent any time with you and really gone through that design thinking process, it really adds to that, 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 that last stage. And yes, the fact that I think there's always so much responsibility when you know, agreements are made, you've got this vision and we're working towards it. But sometimes things get let go there, don't they? And so when you're saying, you know, we get to this stage and yeah, we're going into the design, what will it really look like? And we're going to prototype it. It almost seems to me, the quote that I was looking for earlier was words, words create worlds. And I think, yes, I read that too. That's awesome. Yeah. It is so lovely as well, isn't it? And yeah. yet it's so powerful when I think about the language allows you to think differently. And it is with language that we think. And so even having that mindset going in the into the idea of leading change changes your whole being about your approach. Um, and I feel the same way, Tim, about your idea around the site design thinking or the way that you've implemented it. Because to have this term prototype, it makes it, 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 I find that really encouraging. I find that has an element of discovery in there and an element of excitement. And it gives me kind of the encouragement that I need to try something knowing that it's been well thought out, but also knowing if you're being supported to prototype something, you're being supported to um, whatever the consequence of 
it is. That's just, right. That's yeah. right. And I, and I love that it, it checks off a bunch of boxes that we, you know, that we talk about all the time or we've heard people talk about it all the time and that it's good to fail. We need to fail. Um, and, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. And I think too many times we are afraid of that because we're afraid of being judged. We're afraid of, you know, wasting time, resources. We're afraid that we may not get another opportunity to do this. So better get it right the first time, or, you know, this will be the last time kind of idea. And releasing those, those constrictions, I really believe brings in way more creativity. And I think allows creativity that's been stifled to bubble to the top. And, and I, I've seen it so many times where, you know, the hardest person in the room, by the time we get to that design stage is now fully engaged. It's going to look different than somebody else, but they're fully engaged and they're, they're being creative in their own way. Right. I've just, I've seen it too many times to, to pass it up as just happenstance. No, I like it. And I like it also when they, when they talk about the different uh, principles and um, we've been doing a lot of work um, uh, within my institution on, um, on looking at, you know, in the indigenization piece of, um, of our, our college, our institution, our programs. And we've had, um, we've had uh, two guests that have come in and done a lot of consultation work with, all areas of the college over the last few months. So we're really looking forward to those findings coming through. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we talked about so much was, you know, storytelling and, um, you know, allowing time to talk through different situations. And one of the principles um, in this chapter was the narrative and awareness principle. And it talks about weaving stories and, you know, that will create lasting bonds and, and capture the importance of use of storytelling in order for people um, to see each other for who they really are. And, you know, we've talked, you talked a little bit about, you know, dialogue and, um, and discussion. And I don't think we allow enough time for that. And, um, you know, we know from being, especially this past year, like being on zoom, having an agenda, like we have one hour together. We, we are dictated sometimes by, you know, our capacity on, you know, through zoom and our calendars. And so, um, there are some aspects I feel that reading this, like some of the principles I was like, oh yeah, like we, we could totally, you know, that's incorporated. I've seen that happen a lot, but I'm like, oh, this, this doesn't happen as much. We don't allow enough time, um, you know, to, to, um, to, to talk and what we know. And I think what we've built a lot of our structures on, um, in, in the three of us and, you know, our small network, you know, that the, the, th the three, four or five of us that chat quite often, um, is that we've, yes, we've connected through work and, and a lot of the, the work, um, in meetings and different things that we've been doing together, but it's the time after these meetings that we really connect and that we, um, we really kind of allow time and, and we don't actually focus on our differences in that, in that time, in that social time, we focus on, you know, the, the things that we have in common and we build each other up and we have fun and we share stories. And sometimes I don't know if you've had these meetings at work that could be very tense. And then afterwards you'll go for a drink and it's actually lovely. And so, um, and, and so it's actually trying to weave in that kind of culture. So that, that kind of stood out to me, um, as you know, something that, I need to, you know, I feel like that I need to figure out how this, you can allow for this comfortable culture to happen, you know, more often, um, especially in our institution. So, um, yeah, so. And, and I think like Lucy, you just said there about with, um, you know, um, the calls to action and, and a lot of uh, work being done with, um, I, I want to say this word and I can't, pronounce this so I'm not going to say it but with their you know our indigenous uh, members at the at the university that we work with and and one of the things that I've learned from them is exactly like what you were just saying there but also what Tim was saying about learning to listen and you know within a talking circle there isn't a time limit on it so we're very time you know, we've got this whole to the clock, but that isn't, that's not part of their agenda. And then when you talk, it is your time, but it's not the, the people are not going to respond. Like you're not talking 
so that people are then going to give you their opinions and things what you said. So I know Rita Gower, who's actually been a guest on, on the podcast here, for her master, she actually explored this indigenization of this uh, um, approach of her curriculum around the talking circles. And they would start each day with this. And of course, it took a few weeks to get this whole di- idea because her students hadn't done this practice before, but they did learn to listen. And they, she said that um, it, at some days it was very quick, even though she had 18 students, some days it would be like 20 minutes max. But other days, it would be much, much longer. And to begin with, she had a structured question. But then after that, the questions would evolve. And I think that because, again, it's that shift of culture, isn't it? Instead of being guided by the clock and, you know, these quick check-ins where you just say, and people just say, oh, I'm fine. But to tell your stories, it's a pretty lonely world if you, you know, if you think of the hours we spend in the workplace and if nobody knows your story, like any of your stories. Yeah. And to be able to share your experience through stories. So maybe you have an issue with something that's happening in your department or in, you know, in your school right now. And you can actually talk about why you have that issue. You know, what experiences have you had that have made you feel uncomfortable about this. And it gives you, it gives you some time to kind of just, um, you know, share these highlights through storytelling. And and so you can focus on, you know, okay, now I can see your point of view, you know, you're not just disgruntled and, and allow for space for this kind of storytelling to happen. But I think, you know, it's something that doesn't happen so naturally. Like a lot of the other things I was like, oh yeah, that I feel like that, that happens. And I feel like I allow time for that. And I, I just feel that this one is sometimes not, something that you know in our you know in our institutions happens enough yeah yeah and I know many moons ago I went to a BC campus um conference and there was um um the first speaker that introduced herself actually gave her introduction um by talking about her family and who her uncles were and who her grandparents were. And then she asked all of the audience to turn to the person next to them and introduce themselves in the same way. Mm-hmm. And so it was pretty powerful. And, you know, so you turn to a total stranger in my case, and suddenly I'm saying like, I'm the child of Bill and Esther And I have, you know, and Bill was from Ireland. So I'm telling this and I have two sisters. And, you know, at that point, I think I'd lived in Canada for, I don't know, maybe, maybe 15 years, something like that. Nobody had ever asked me who my parents were. And I'd never had the opportunity to tell. And I'd even been in circles where people were asking other people where they grew up because they had context. If somebody said, oh, you know, I grew up in Kelowna or I grew up in Fernie, people could talk about it. But when it got to me, they they, they didn't even stop. They just moved on because they knew that I grew up in England. They could tell by my accent. And, and And so I think those experiences, when you notice things like that and then you just realize how often do we make time for, you know, for voice and for stories. And I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but I think it's worth doing. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. One of the hardest principles I've, I've found incorporating into the process, not from my own perspective, but getting others on board with is the positive, positive principle. Because usually you're brought in to help solve a problem, mitigate an issue. Uh, There's something external being forced upon the group, the team, the department, the school to that they have to adapt and change to <clears throat> AKA COVID. Right. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to use that example. Cause I think that's, that's too meta, but I've been in enough situations where the positive principle has been the hardest ones most times to enact in the beginning and to maintain throughout the process. Um, and, and the reason is, is because they nail it right in the, in the section here where they say that all parts of the AI methodology are influenced by the positive principle from the topic selection to the question development, to the images created and the strategies designed 
to move towards a desired future. And that's a hard thing to get people to move through when they're stuck in the negative, when they're stuck in the, and it's a victim perspective and some of it is shouldn't be dismissed and there's there's some of that there but it's almost like we don't have a choice this has been forced upon us i don't want to do this this is dumb this is stupid um why is it like this it was so much better before when we had all this freedom and all this you know all this ability to do stuff and now they're coming down with all these rules and regulations and policies and you know somebody just came into power and now they just want to change everything because they they want it to be theirs and that may all be true. You know, that may be all be true, right? You, you, you can't deny that and you can't take that away, but it's like, okay, so what are we going to do about this? And, and getting them to think through the positive pieces of that package that they have mm-hmm. for me, most times has been the, the most troublesome piece of this whole AI th- chapter. And and it's not because it rubs me the wrong way because I feel I'm a pretty positive person most times, but it, I found it hard to get traction in the group, right? Because I, I know that we're, we're almost wired to think about the negative more than the positive for the most part. Yeah. And I really like the way in the book, they structure those questions all the way through the process. So they've, they've planned this up front to frame it from that positive perspective. And I think that's one of the things, isn't it, to, you know, it's all very deliberate and it keeps taking people through this journey. So we we do this with this positively framed question. What, you know, what do you, what does it, what do you like at your best? I can't find one of those questions right now, but, um, um, and then as, as they narrow down, cause they start very broad, don't they? What does the department like at its best and then go narrower and I think that is key to the process but just like backward design curriculum design aligning that alignment between your assessment and your learning outcomes you know that we talk about being so critical and then all those uh you know the the content and all the um teaching activities there has to be this consistency of alignment and so I think sometimes Taking, I think what you're talking about, and 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 tell me if I'm completely over, you know, out in left field here. But what we're doing a lot of the time is taking this mindset and inserting it, emerging it, you know, immersing it in a culture that is completely opposite. So even though we bring all these people together, and we have even if we've spent you know, a lot of time working out our big questions that we're going to pose and we've done a great job there, outside of those doors of the room that they sit in to do these activities exists a whole other culture that they've lived in until that point. And I wonder how much that plays into this. I mean, obviously, Jeannie and Joe MacArthur, they've got obviously been through this process and would know how to answer these questions. But I mean, a paradigm shift in this approach, I mean, I absolutely love that. But for others actually coming in for a one-day session or a two-day session, we've got to live this. This has got to become like the lived culture, hasn't it, within the departments and, you know, hopefully within the institutions. Yeah. And that was one of my, you know, questions that I had was for both of you was like, you know, if you, if you're somebody that's coming into um, wanting to really focus on appreciative inquiry as a way in which to facilitate um, their meetings or, you know, the, the culture, maybe change the culture in their department, like where would you start? Like what advice would you give and where would you start? And um, you know, that positive thing that um, you know, the positive chapter. I mean, it was it, that section was like the shortest section in the book because it does, it does like talk about it in obviously in all other sections, but it is just trying to, you know, focus on what we can build um, to what we can't. And when I first started to, um, I don't know if I, I'd, I'd actually studied appreciative inquiry yet um, in my master's or we talked about it, but I would start out my uh, faculty meetings um, 
with um, like a round table about everyone's PD who's been on PD, you know, this month. And can you tell us um, some of the great things that you learned uh, or that you discovered when you were on PD? And so even though, even though it was just such a small thing, the, the faculty meetings when we'd all come together and sometimes it was, it was in times when it was, you know, there was a lot of factors at play and a lot of stress that was happening within the team. Um, and, um, and it was a really good way to just all think about, oh yeah, that's what we're here for. You know, that's great that you learned that. And could you share those resources with us? And uh, where did you go to take that training? And so it's a really good way to kind of, you know, it wasn't a forced way, like, okay, so everyone let's all say one thing that we loved about today's meeting. It's like, really, you know, that, that kind of seems so forced to me when you start off like that, like, oh, Hey, you know, so you know, Sally and Tim, you've been on PD this, this month um, or last month. And I just wondered if you would, you know, wouldn't mind sharing some of your you know, some success stories from, you know, from your PD. And that was just like one small thing. So, you know, my question to you after reading this chapter was, you know, if someone's getting started on, um, on AI, like what, what kind of tip would you give them on where to start and how to focus their work or focus their energy? Because it's one thing to structure like a big strategic plan through appreciative inquiry or like, um, you know, or something, you know, something that's quite big, but in your everyday practice, how do you bring it? How do you bring in this focus? I think you, it's almost like you answered it, Lucy, I think, because you just said in your everyday practice, how do you bring this in? And I think that's it exactly. Like, first of all, noticing your own practice, like noticing how often you know in like as I explore situations how often am I looking for the problems well you know and I actually start practicing looking for the positives myself and recognizing them and spending time like identifying why what makes those those things the best what makes them so great so I think to get started is maybe that is like for even if it's a week or a couple of weeks, just even taking notes, noticing the way that you, because, you know, we're all in meetings that we're leading on a regular basis and noticing, you know, the opportunities that we provide for others. And, and when we have provided opportunities for positive, um, like the positive to shine. That's what I'm, you know, really thinking about, but very much starting small and maybe, um, and I'm thinking about um, an example just uh, last year working with just a small group of instructors. And uh, this is one of Jesse Chalmers' uh, leadership tricks, actually hand selecting people and telling them, you know, do you fancy doing a little bit of work with us? Because we see you championing this in our department. So people feel good before they even begin the process. And then the process, that was the authentic assessment project, but it was very small. And for me, I think to really learn this and to really put it into practice has got to start with me. And then it will be a, you know, a smaller group. For me, it's, I'll boil it down to two words, maybe two phrases. The first one is values. So find out what people value. I'll give you an example. I was, I was leading a strategic planning committee within a department and there was five people on that committee, different backgrounds, but within the same trade, very different backgrounds different personalities, maybe even some tension there. Uh, The first meeting that we met, I asked them this question. Why do you get out of bed in the morning to come here for seven o'clock every day outside of the paycheck and the pension? Why do you come here outside of the paycheck and the pension? And I was, <laughs> and I was blown away by the answers, right? From everything from, well, it's I, it's I, I love to teach, and I've learned all this stuff from the, all these great people, and I want to pass it on. 
uh, to variants of that to one where it, it really helped me make a connection to this person later on because the person said that they felt that they had a duty. They had a duty to industry to educate the apprentices that came through their, their classroom. And I went, that's, that's a very unique answer. One that you would very rarely hear that I have a duty. It's my duty to do this for industry, not just to my, me or the Institute or for the apprentice, but to industry. I owe it to industry to do this. And so the question of value for me has never been a wasted question. Right. And so whether, I, whether it's in a big group or a small group, one-on-one, -on -one, I try to always find out what the value is because once I find out what you value now, now I can touch that. And I can be the Jesse Chalmers and walk up to Sally and say, Sally, would you like to be a part of this project? Because I know that this is important to you for these reasons. And I don't, I don't have to sell it. I, I just say, I already know that you feel this way and boom, 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 boom. And chances are nine times out of 10, Sally will say yes. Um, and, and I've seen it work when dealing with conflict. I've, I've had a person, multiple people in my offices at times. And, and I said, I know how you feel because you value this, you value respect, you value the integrity, you value all these things and you feel like you're not getting that, or this is missing the mark. And so you're, you're frustrated and PO'd. So, and then, and then this, that, that leads me to the second part. So I find out the value of the person or the group. And then I ask more questions than I can answer. So it's inquiry. So it's, it's simply like, uh, and into positive things. So it's like, okay, so tell me a time when this really worked for you, right? Tell me, tell me about a time when everything was going really super awesome for you. Um, or tell me a time when you felt like you knocked it out of the park, like you left that class that day and you would say to yourself, this is my best day. Why? Why did you feel that way? What happened? And during that day to make you feel like that. Everyone has those stories. Some of them are, you know, some people feel it's easier to tell than others. Um, and so, so you have to coax a little bit. Uh, others, you just simply, you don't even finish the question yet and they're answering it for you. <laughs> but um, it's, and, and because it's sharing the story. And so I, I always, I, I, I always try to find the value that the person connects with. Like, why do you do this? outside of pay and, and remuneration and, and the golden watch at the end. Cause that's, that's what really drives people. Right. And find out what, find out what drives them, find out what they value, then start asking them questions about really strong, positive experiences that now begins to open the box to figure out, okay, so how do we make that happen in the future? And, and more often than not, the negativity gets diminished or it can completely exclude it because they're, they're putting two and two together and going, oh, okay. So it's not wrong to link up my value with an outcome and that doesn't necessarily magically align with a provincial outcome or, you know, an RSOS or somebody's syllabus or rubric or whatever. Right. So that's what I do. Yeah, I like that. And that stood out to me, you know, when I, I took some notes on that earlier um, and uh, Sally might talk to this a uh, bit more about this, but under the um, constructivist principle, because what you talked about uh, right now made me link to that because um, you have to think about how, how this would work if you're working, they talk about in the book, if you're working with um, the different cultures within one institution. So it could be different campuses or it could be, automotive, they talk about automotive nursing and mathematics and how you would, you know, strike up that, that desire, the values like, that you were talking about and um, with, with three completely different cultures and what you talked about just there. I mean, when you said, um, uh, the duty to industry, like I owe it to industry to do this, like within trades, I hear that a lot, like industry need us to do this. They, they, they need us to uh, provide them with, you know, this, these apprentices and to support these students and to understand these systems. And I think, you know, it doesn't matter if you are, you know, sitting in a, you know, a room full of, you know, plumbing instructors, or, you know, you're sitting in room with a room with nursing instructors to be able to ask that question, which is hugely valuable and to really 
find out like what, what gets you up in the morning, what gets you in here. And you're going to hear different answers. But I think if you start there, then that does, you know, lead you through to, you know, really discovering where you want to go and how you can start to build a plan on that. So yeah, that, that stuck out to me, um, too. So yeah. And just what you're saying there, Lucy, it's made me think about, um, you probably saw this, I posted it on Twitter last week and it was your jam board that we'd done at the digital tool shed. And of course there's, you know, just to give a bit of context to it. So, um, when we came back to campus in September, we didn't come back to campus. When we returned after the summer and, and, and COVID situation, remote teaching was still going on. We found, you know, at BIU that instructors have taken, like the Teaching and Learning Centre have done an amazing job of putting on workshops on to adapt your course for online, lots of workshops on tech tools and things like that. But when the instructors returned after the summer, they were they were prepared, ready for their their September semester. But what they they didn't have time to take more workshops, and and yet they were still de- dealing very much with the loss of what they usually did and facing all various challenges. So the digital tool shed was launched, which is just. I mean, if you bring it down to bare bones, it is a Zoom session that is hosted every Friday in the trades faculty. And on the on stage as such in that meeting, it will be one or two instructors that um, are sharing things that have worked really well for them. And so sometimes in the backstage part of it, which has been my role, is I've listened to the problems that are coming forward and the challenges and what I'm solving. But at the same time, I'm connecting with people that are having great successes. And then, of course, I ask them, nudge them into saying, cool, you know, would you come along and present on this? And so what's happened is that this has evolved and it's continued. So it's now in month seven. And what it really focuses on even though people are struggling with lots of different things that have come forward, is it focuses on people that have done something and it's worked. But they come to this, you know, they come to this session very humbly telling their story of how they tried this out and what happened and how they built on it. But when you look at it, there's people there from up to 17 different trades. So we now have collaboration Like there's people that said, I've worked at VIU for 12, 14 years. And now they're connecting with like bacon, electrical and welding. So those cultures, because I think, Tim, what you said about values, I didn't ask them what their values were. But when I launched the digital tool shed, it had sort of these uh, principles around it. And the people that came along in essence, actually, this is what they valued. And, and so it's gone from there. So you kind of dissected that nicely for me. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, I love it so much because we, we often talk about motivation, right? We often talk about, especially when we're looking at students, right? Uh, motivation and engagement. And I, I, I don't use the camera uh, with my students when I teach online. In fact, I don't, I don't make it mandatory. And, and the last two terms I've seen two students out of 70 online, like with their cameras on. Um, and I don't force them to turn their mics on. So what I do is all of my interaction is through chat, through the synchronous chat. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing and asking questions and, bringing in Jamboard and Mentimeter and all these, you know, flashy tools that, that are awesome. But it's it, what I'm really driving to is their value system. Right. And it doesn't matter what topic I'm talking about. It, it could be, it could be anything from open systems to um, organizational behavior, change models, uh, intrinsic motivation, applied motivation, leadership. It could be any of those things. Or in the trades world, it could be, how are you dealing with apprentices? How do you deal with your site superintendent? How are you dealing with inspectors? Uh, how are you dealing with clients and engineers? Um, 
so it, it, it really what it boils down to is what, what, what value system do you use and what motivates you to do what you do? And for some it's money. I just want to make money. That's okay. Cool. You want to make money? Awesome. Um, others want to make a difference in the world. Well, what does that look like? Right. And so they, they start piecemealing this together and you start, you start figuring out, okay, I wonder what would happen if I had Lucy who values a and Sally who values F what happens if I put those two people together on a, on a little project Mm -hmm. pretty soon that that's an exponential situation. Right. And it just, it, it works really well. And, and through that, through that engagement process in the chat, I'll ask simple little value questions at the beginning of every class. Right. Um, so what, if, if you were to lose one thing, uh, what would be the worst thing that you could lose? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and some people, some, some people say, some people say my sanity, right. Some people say my cat, uh, other people say, you know, my, my car keys, right. Other people say my clothes, if I, you know, and so you, you soon, and some of them are silly, but most of them are just little windows into their background that now as a, as a faculty member, I'm starting to piece together and go, Oh, okay. So in a couple of weeks I can, I can almost pick out what the value systems are of half of my class. And now I'm starting to lecture to those value systems to keep them engaged mm-hmm. rather than just going through the material. And, and you know, what's interesting when you do intercultural training, if you're going to work on, you know, international projects, like we have this wonderful, um, person at VIU whose name's Mackenzie Silum, and she does this wonderful workshop that's all about intercultural differences and you reminded of me that then Tim because people were asked like what is your most value valuable item that you had with you there and then so it couldn't be something outside of that and um, our project manager at the time he said my tablet and and it truly is like you can get him at any time night or day on this tablet and then um, there was something to do with watches. My colleague, she's like my watch. Like, I just love this watch or whatever. And I can't remember. I really, I really can't remember what mine was at all at the time. But one of the things we got into around watches is like, I didn't have a watch on at the time. And anybody that knows me knows that time is, you know, fluid. It's a bit of a, you know. I'm just a construct. <laughs> yeah. It is. I was telling Dean this yesterday when the clock How changed. do you perceive it? Yeah, That's time right. is a social construct. Like, you know, so yes, you can change the clocks. It doesn't mean to say I have to get up at that time. Anyway, that's a different story. But I think those things even, like even, I mean, there's another piece of this as well. It does allow people to tell their stories, which is kind of a bringing us back full circle to, you know, where Lucy was talking about this value of storytelling. And, and I mean, how many courses have you been through with other people? You know, you think of all your years of education. And when you think back to the courses or the classes or whatever that were most value to you, just to even deconstructing that and really think about what made it so valuable. And, um, and, you know, I know for me, there would have been lots of stories and I could probably today tell you a story about many like people in my master's cohorts, stories that they had shared because we were very fortunate that there was that time put in place for us to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. My, um, you know, in my master's program, I had Dr. Michael Ling. He was just incredible. Like he was the one that really solidified, this is why I need to be doing this right now. And this is why I'm doing it with this cohort. They, you know, he was the person that really did bring us all together. But one of the things that he did that was valuable, that kind of links to what, um, what you're saying, Sally, and what Tim was talking about is, you know, allowing you to, um, whether it's, whether you're asking someone what's more valuable, like, you know, or, you know, what, if you were to lose something today, what it would be, you're allowing them to bring in and understand where they come from, what their experiences are. And, um, and I love that they talked about this in the book because that's why this was important to me with, with 
with Dr. Michael Ling is because he allowed us to bring our experience in and talk about our journey and why we are where we are today and what led us to this journey. And now he gave us space to tell that story. Each of us tell that story. And um, so obviously I love that <laughs> being able to talk about my, you know, my, my entire life and what led me to today, but it, it basically allowed us to all see each other as we, as we were, so it was, it was just hugely powerful. Um, and I don't know if it was, it's powerful every time he does this, or if it's just sometimes it's just special. Like I'm not, I'm not fully sure, but I really liked that when they talked about, you know, the can, the constructivist principle that it talks about bringing in that experience. Um, and it, and it, it does explain that, um, education and institutions that we work in educational institutions are complex because they come with, um, different lenses because they have people that have developed, you know, all different experiences over time. And then you're asking them to all be the same way in this same pot. And so it's kind of understanding those experiences. And the other thing too, it's, it, it talked about a very um, unique environment where you are both working and learning at exactly the same time. And in my position that I'm in now as an instructional associate, I, I talk about that quite often that I feel like you know, I'm working and learning and it's, it's so like, you know, fluid with one another. Like sometimes I just feel like, God, I just learned today. I just absorbed. And then other days I'm like, God, I just like gave, gave away all my ideas and knowledge today. Like I just feel drained from that. So, um, and I think just being part of the, an institution where you kind of, you feel that, and then you also allow that within your classrooms as well. You allow to talk about, um, you know, what experiences people are bringing in, what values they're bringing in, because they're all different. And if you don't allow that space to discuss that, then that's where you get conflict. And that's where people don't, you know, don't come together. So, um, yeah. Because they don't, they, because they don't feel. Yeah. They don't feel valued. Yeah. And there's also a line in there as well that it was right on key here is about working across those differences. And, and they, the authors speak about power, diversity and privilege. And I think about this, like, you know, um, I think that recognizing that you're privileged, but also recognizing at different times you don't hold the power and others hold that power. And, and I think that, you know, we've all felt those, that, that vulnerability and where your voice isn't valid. And so I think that, again, this is like when it's a cultural shift and it is a lived shift that it diffuses this, doesn't it? It flattens that hierarchy, but you have to be able to trust. So this is, I guess this is what I was saying earlier about, you know, you can do this for a couple of days and, and the authors give this wonderful example of when they've actually um, provided this storytelling consistently. So it really has begun to diffuse that power differential but what if that doesn't exist outside of those meetings? So you have the facilitators come in, they practice this. But then what if you go out of there and then you go into, you know, a different meeting and now you're shoved back into a different structure? So it, it's one of those things, you know, we always want to change the world, but it's like to work in an institution, I think. This comes back to what both of you have been saying, but especially around these values, like your own values need to align with the institutional values, don't they? You know, when I, the more I look at the academic plan and our strategic plan and read that and, and you realize how important it is of where you choose to work, if your values don't align with those and then you know, to have a workshop maybe for a couple of days where they do, but that's not the lived culture, it's going to be problematic. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's, and that's one reason why I have a love-hate relationship with concerts and conferences and, you know, big flashy keynote speakers and all that, because you, you get all this great information, you get all this stuff yeah. thrown at you, you know, and you're there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but Thursday comes 
and you're, and you're yeah. back in that swamp that you just didn't want to be back yeah. in. Right. Or you go to this, you go and listen to somebody fantastic on the weekend and you know that Monday morning's coming and you're like, Oh, I got to go to that committee meeting on Monday. Mm-hmm. My, well, who holds a committee meeting on Monday morning anyway? Like that's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Right. And so this, this is where I really, tend to encourage people to focus on their own system first and to think of themselves as advocates of that when they leave and go into those other systems. So if, if, if I'm, if I'm helping somebody understand this idea of AI and, and, you know, the determined dialogue described that whole process, start that with yourself and find out how that centers or or not centers, how that circles around your value system. And if you can't, if you can't figure out your value system, you need to spend time on what you've, what you, on your value system, you need to figure out what's important to you. Once you get that down, I think now you're in a stronger position to move into a slightly different environment and go, you know what? Okay. This may not align with my values, but this is how I can bring my values into this situation and, and maybe change it for the better. Uh, at least help me cope with it and until it changes or maybe wait until I'm in a position of more influence where I can start, um, you know, in a, in, in an appreciative way, begin to create change through that influence. Um, so that's, that's, that's very powerful. And sometimes that takes time. Um, and it's vulnerable to a certain extent too, because you have to be willing to take that step out in that, less than desirable environment, but that's, I, that's what I try to practice when I'm moving into a new arena. And that's what I, that's what I try to get others to, to think about too, is, you know, what do you value and, and how do you, how do you carry that with you into that other situation? I wonder as well, just, you know, if the situation isn't changing, but just even somebody spending time with this book and, and and really beginning to live this, practice this, this becomes their practice in situations. I wonder how, how much influence one person can have when they're constantly reframing the, you know, the questions, the way they approach. So if you're in a very problematic meeting and you're able to listen to that, but you actually are capturing, you know, where when we were at our best today in that meeting was when we were planning this, you know, and so actually acknowledging that I wonder how much influence one person can have, you know, even just like, um, you know, you're saying Lucy making time after difficult meetings, making time to go for a drink together to the pub. And obviously that was in our pre COVID days, but we've made time to have drinks together on, you know, on Zoom as well. And really, you know, that the moment somebody says, oh, do you want to meet just for a drink on Zoom? That they're telling you that they value your friend, you know, your friendship. They value spending time with you. And so even the invite changes that, doesn't it, changes yeah. that environment. So I'm wondering, I, I'm really curious to know, and I, I wonder if we should look at that for this week with all uh, this coming week with all of their interactions and actually sort of consciously think, okay, you know, what can I reframe within this situation? And, or, you know, maybe you, Maybe your weeks are going to be plain sailing, so you won't need to put anything to practice. Well, I'm potty training on spring break, so oh, um, well, go. I'm going to take an appreciative mm. inquiry approach to I that. I would say lots of positive <laughs> um, reinforcement. Yeah, lots of positive reinforcement. But um, yeah, but I did want to. I did. I just wanted to tap into that situation piece because, um, like I, I, I feel I feel like I should do a, a good shout out to the CTLR department that I work in because, you know, um. I don't feel like I've moved into this role and, and I have to change a culture like it. And that's, that's not happened very often. Like I, I, I found that many times I've gone into new teams or new areas and I feel like, you know, this culture needs some, you know, some work or it doesn't gel. And it's funny that it wasn't ever something that happened 
you know, forcefully, it was, it was so natural. And that's why I feel like I'm, it's just an awesome team to be in because like, we all go to the same meetings, like by accident, like, or the same workshop, sorry, by accident, like we show up and we look at the participants and we're like, oh my God, we're all here. Like happens so often. So we're all going through this journey together. It's never something that's like, you know, one of us is doing all of this, you know, cool stuff and, you know, and, and they're kind of out left wing. And then we're all kind of doing something different here. It's not like that. We tend to be on this journey together. And if we see this workshop that we feel is going to be pretty good, we share it with everyone and everyone tries to go just, it just, that's just the way they work. And I know it doesn't happen in every culture and I've, I've worked in difficult cultures also. And that, that's something that does need to take time and it needs to, you, you know, you can't just show up with butterflies and rainbows and expect everyone to be positive, but the cultural shift happens because when you said, Tim, like, what are your values? When you start to create this positive culture and this positive environment, when people want to share and they want to help grow and they want to feel that it's a safe space to give ideas, the people that don't belong in that culture tend to disappear from that culture. Yeah, that's very true. It's very true. It very takes true. a long time, but, um, and then you start to look around you and think, wow, like I'm around people that want to do this, that want that striving for the same, the same dream, the same desire. Like they, they want to make an action. They want to build something great. So that tends to be something happens. It, it, it talks in this chapter as well. Like, how do you start? Like, what can you do when you go back in September, you know, to start implementing some change and, and I think that it, you know, it would be kind of cool even within a department to say, Hey, like I've looked at this approach. I've read this book. Here's a free code for this book. Everyone here's a free code. Like let's all start reading it. And maybe we can spend a standing item in our meetings every month could just be like what we've maybe brought from, from this. And, you know, so it's not going to happen overnight um, and everyone's situation is different. But what you said to him about, you know, look at your situation, look at what, you know, you can do within your own lens and, you know, what can happen around you and, and see what level of IA that you're naturally at and where you need to improve. So, um, yeah, so I think that was, that was, uh, so that's my little shout out to, to the team I work in. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's good, fabulous. Because one, one of the things like it really summarizes it when you look at institutions and how small their teaching and learning centers are. I mean, I don't know how many there are, Lucy, in yours, but it, in ours, we're sort of like, we go between about six to 10, depending on where we're at. And I think the thing is that draws people for those opportunities. They're not easy opportunities, you know, to get. And I think that so you've actually got people that have chosen to work there. And so, like you say, when, you know, when you've got these different kind of meetings and you said people that, are, you know, don't value things will eventually leave. And I think that's one of the things with our institutions is that sometimes people are in situations where they don't value what is really on the table or what the whole purpose is, um, but they can't leave. They can't leave because of what Tim said earlier. So to really come back, and I think that's a really good reason to bring AI onto the table because that person, although they would maybe choose to leave, they don't have those choices, they need to stay in these positions, but maybe AI can bring them you know, way more happiness and, and create a different environment, uh, you know, around them. I mean, you think so, because what the alternative to that is that the, the people that do want to strive for change and do want to create a positive will leave. And so you're, you know, that's the opposite. And that's what you don't want to happen. You know, you don't want people to come in with all their ideas and they be shut down and told that, you know, they are grandiose and you, you know, you can't kind of, you can't thrive here, then they're going to go somewhere else. So what, what are the alternatives? And so they're, they're, you know, and it's not like I, you know, when you, when you facilitate in with an IA approach that it's going to be all happy and sparkles and, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's going to be difficult, but as long as at the end, you know, and you might all, you know, you might all feel that you have to go through it pretty deep in order to come out 
to a conclusion, but that, and that's okay as well. There's all, there's different levels to it, which is. Sure. And that's important. And cause I've, I've, I've done that with a bunch of groups. I think I even did that with your group, Sally and Lucy, when I was with you Probably. right at the beginning, <laughs> um, where I kept trying to bring in the positive and let's look at the, let's look at the good side of this and the negative kept coming up and I just mm-hmm. made the decision. Okay. Let's spend the next little while talking about everything that you hate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let's yeah. just get it get out. It, we need to get it out. Get it yeah. out and vent and know that this is just going to land on the table. We'll, we're going to hear you. We'll see it. Doesn't leave the room, but just get it out. And because I, I had this, clarity moment. And it's not because, you know, I'm so, in, I'm like that. It just happens sometimes where I have this clarity moment where it's like, okay, we need to get rid of this before we can start moving in this, this mm-hmm. other direction that we need mm-hmm. to do. And, and it's almost like taking the, that big, heavy backpack off and just leaving it at the door. Right. And then, so it, it, and the really thing, the thing that I really love about appreciative inquiry is that you're not dismissing it right? Like you're not telling people to pull up their socks and, you know, you know, smile and get out the door and, you know, everyone has to go through all this. It's like, yeah, you know what, that, that would really bug me too. I would be really mad if that happened. And that's valuable to that, that you've said that. And that's important. So we're, we're going to take what you said and put it over here and maybe we'll come back to it, but then we're going to move on to the next person. And sure enough, it just, it diffuses everybody. And they're like, huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can, I can talk about (laughs) alternatives and maybe some solutions. They're not quite ready to buy in yet because they're like, they're still skeptical and they're still hurting and bruised and scarred all that. But they're like, okay, you've allowed me to, to tell you why I think this is going to be stupid Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you haven't left and you haven't gotten mad at me and you haven't told me to shut up and all these things that other people have, have said, okay, maybe I'm willing to give it a try. So maybe this is a good opportunity to kind of wrap up the podcast. And, and if you don't mind, I'd like to read just a little snippet from the last paragraph. Cause I think, I think it encapsulates what the two of you have been saying um, really in a, in a really uh, great way. So the last chapter, uh, sorry, the last paragraph is on page 39. I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph, just a couple of lines it says AI is an opportunity, sometimes rare, to interact dynamically with others, co-creating, sharing stories, collaboratively engaging in, a, in processes that focus on their best in order to be even better and coming up with very concrete ways to do this. And, and, and that's, that's really the heartbeat of AI is focusing on what you can do and now what can we do better, right? And that, that's, I think that's a beautiful cap mm-hmm. on the, on the yeah podcast. in a welcoming supportive environment yeah yep. absolutely and, i mean it even feels good talking about it but it does it makes hour, you excited yeah like yes, it, it does is, yeah it does i knew this, this chapter would bring about a lot of discussion though because there's so many there's so many good points to it and uh it's um definitely if you're skeptical about ai and you're not quite sure just go straight to chapter two <laughs> kind of yeah, skip chapter yeah. one <laughs> yeah, chapter just kind of two go, first. Over, go over that and yeah. be like yeah and now i now i feel like i can commit to the book so, uh, yeah. beautiful all right well thanks everybody for taking the time to listen to this awesome podcast and uh we look forward to the next in input where we look at chapter three so thanks very much